He played in the shadow of two of baseball's greatest icons, his brother Joe and his charismatic teammate Ted Williams. Many believe that has cost him his own rightful place in the Baseball Hall of Fame. He was called the Little Professor, not just because he wore glasses, but because he was so smart. He might be the most underrated great player ever. The Dominic DiMaggio story is next on this special edition of the Red Sox Report presented by CVS Pharmacy. Thanks for tuning in. Perhaps this tiny 10 by 12 room on Taylor Street in San Francisco should be on the National Register of Historic Places. For this is the bedroom shared by Dominic, Joe, and Vince DiMaggio when they were all young boys dreaming of the day they might play baseball. In fact, nine DiMaggio children and their parents shared this modest apartment. It sits on Taylor Street, just up the hill from Fisherman's Wharf, where Dom's father worked from dawn to dusk as a fisherman. No one had any idea that three soon-to-be-famous big league brothers were sharing that tiny bedroom. Let's start with your, your young days. Um, when you were playing sandlot ball out in San Francisco, you were an infielder in those days. Oh, yes. Throughout my entire uh, playing Prior to signing with the San Francisco Ball Club, I was an infielder all the way. Shortstop most of the time? Shortstop, yes. Uh, played shortstop, had a pretty good arm. Uh, did not wear glasses right away. Oh. I played without glasses. And as a result, I didn't hit too well. And as I got a little bit older in my early teens, I thought, you know, I think I ought to try my glasses. But because they were breakable, I was concerned. Yeah. But I did use them, and I immediately noticed a tremendous uh, improvement. How did your father take to um, the, um, uh, his sons playing, playing ball? I mean, he was a guy who worked, you know, the, the hard way, uh, you know, as, as an immigrant, uh, not familiar with the, uh, with the language, and out on, out on the bay, which can get pretty choppy every single day. Prior to Vince entering professional baseball, uh, he thought that it was a game that was a useless thing to do, and he had the work ethic, and he felt that we should have the work ethic. But Vince went on to play professional baseball, and it kind of opened his eyes a little bit. In fact, while Vince was playing, he'd throw Vince's glove and shoes in the trash barrel. Mom go back and dig them out. <laughs> so uh, when Joe broke in, then of course, he said, oh, he said, uh, they pay you for this. And uh, yeah, and so he became very famous. And then when Joe came to New York, turned to me, he says, and when are you going to start playing baseball? And you see how he transformed from uh, negative to positive. So you're 19 years old, and the San Francisco Seals sign you. And the first thing that happens is some of the uh, press and the media out there thought that it was just a publicity stunt because, of your, because your name was DiMaggio. Because you were small and you wore glasses, they didn't think you were a real player. Tom Laird, the uh, sports columnist for the San Francisco Daily News, thought that there was no ball player like my brother Joe. And when I signed with the Seals, that's what Mr. Laird said. He would write a column, and when he wanted to be very emphatic, he would write in italics. And he would write something about Joe in the very next paragraph. He would say, and that kid brother of his will never be a baseball player. <laughs> and so, uh, Actually, I think going back, my one desire was to play one year of professional baseball. Really? And Tom Blair did me a big favor because when he wrote that, I said, by golly, I'm going to get to the big leagues. And I played hard, and I ran into Tom about four or five years later after I'd come to the Red Sox, and I told him the story. He said, that's not true that I wrote those things. 
I said, yes, it is, Tom. I said, but I want to thank you for it. He says, you do? Why? I said, because you gave me the inspiration to go on. He said, oh, that's different. <laughs> and you're playing center field by this time with the, yes. uh, uh, with the Seals. And um, you had a manager and a hitting instructor who had a great, great effect on your career and on the career of, careers of hundreds of other players. Frank Lefty O'Doul was my manager. I couldn't have been luckier. Uh, when I arrived, I had a tendency to lunge when I was batting because I felt being small of stature, I would get more power by lunging and putting my weight forward. Completely incorrect. He immediately noticed it. He said, we have to work on this. The other basics, I was pretty well uh, taken care of with that. But uh, he said, we've got to work on your hitting. So he worked, and we worked daily, and I did everything he said. And finally, he took movies of me and showed where I was lunging, where I should have stayed still and kept back, actually, and had my weight on my back foot. So uh, you, you end up uh, three years with Lefty, and your last years. year you're 22 years old. You hit 360. You had 39 stolen bases, and you're the uh, Pacific Coast League Most Valuable Player. Correct. And on your way to the major leagues. Correct. Welcome back. On April 16, 1940, Dominic DiMaggio moved from the Pacific Coast to the Atlantic Coast and to the major leagues. The Boston Red Sox buy your contract from... Uh, San Francisco. From San Francisco. How did you feel about coming to Boston? I mean, this is, that's the other side of the world from San Francisco. Well, I really didn't much care. I, I just felt that I was going to the big leagues. And as long as I was in Boston, I knew there was a rivalry between Boston and the Yankees. So I said, well, that's okay with me. There'll be a rivalry with Joe and me. And there was. I read, uh, I read a story that during your rookie year, when you first played in uh, uh, Yankee Stadium, that Joe told you you were playing a little too shallow in the stadium because the ball carried in center field there. One day he did. He thought I was playing a little too shallow. And so I uh, went out in batting practice the next day, and I noticed how the wind currents were a little different than a normal ballpark. So uh, I did take about five, ten paces further back. And then I stole two balls from him that were hit way deep into the left center field. <laughs> so. Had Joe known that, probably he wouldn't have given you the, well, advice. <laughs> the advice. And when you're playing in center field, I guess you did this all your career, even in the, uh, in the minors, you did not take a normal stance facing home plate. No. Uh, all the years that I was in the minors, in the, on the sand lots and played shortstop, I thought that if I ever played the outfield, especially center field, I would stand that way because I felt I would have a better opportunity to run in on line drives. And now, when go you say back. stand that way, you're talking oh, sideways. Yeah. I would face left field when the batter was batting with uh, my left foot in front of my right toward home plate. And once in a while, when I felt uh, more comfortable, I'd turn around and face right field, but not very often. And that's when Tom Laird wrote from go back to Tom Laird. He said I could not go to my left into right field for a fly ball. But I disproved, disproved that as we went along. In yeah. Portland, Oregon, somebody hit a ball over Ted Norbert's head in left field, and I caught it. The next guy hit a ball over Johnny Gill's head in right field, and I caught that one. And I think that was the first time Tom Lynn said, this kid can play outfield. Um, I once read that uh, someone said that of the three DiMaggio brothers, Joe was the best hitter Dom was the best fielder, and Vince was the best singer. 
he missed his calling. He should have been an operatic uh, star. I, I, Vince had a fabulous voice, and he loved singing. He should have been an. He used to sing in the outfield, I guess, between well, probably, pitches. But <laughs> I don't think he would sing loudly to the crowd. <laughs> Well, you you like to sing. Did you ever sing in the outfield? You know oh, all those. I sing for my own amazement. All the old uh, operatic uh, arias. I remember. Uh, I remember you serenading Ted when we went down to visit him. Sure. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we had him laughing, didn't we? We had him laughing. We had him laughing uh, big time that night. One of the marks of Dominic DiMaggio's greatness was his consistency. He was a perennial all-star. He was also adept at accepting and deflecting praise. So 1941 comes along, and now you're established, and uh, you're an all-star in 1941. Uh, and, and stayed an all-star every year except two years that you were hurt. You were hurt in 42 and you were hurt in 47. And you didn't play enough in the early part of the 39 season, you know, 40 season, your rookie year. But every other year, you were an all star. You got a better memory than I you had. You were an all star every other year. And it wasn't easy making the all star team in those years because one, your brother Joe was going to be on the team. And the guy who played next to you in left field. He was going to be on the team. Williams was going to be on the team. I've said that down through the years. I said it's pretty nice to know that I was the third starting outfielder when you've got Ted Williams and Joe DiMaggio who are going to be there every year. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty nice. It feels pretty good. I felt very privileged to have my brother in center and my home teammate yeah. in left field. Well, you have a, um, a unique perspective on Ted Williams and Joe DiMaggio other than Babe Ruth, are the most enduring legends in the game. And you were the brother of one of them, uh, grew up in the same bedroom with him, uh, played the same position that he did, and your dear friend who was right next to you in, uh, in left field uh, was, the, was, was the other one. Nobody um, in baseball history has that perspective on two great icons of the game. At Fenway Park in left field, we had the scoreboard there, and he had the scoreboard keeper back there. And when Joe was on his streak, he would be talking to the scoreboard keeper often. Ted would. Ted would. Yep. And uh, uh, he'd tell the scorekeeper, give me a wave when Joe gets his hit, if Joe gets a hit. So the guy would call, and he'd turn around to ask him, and Tommy, Joe got a double in the third <laughs> inning. OK, Teddy. <laughs> And you were in the on-deck circle in the 1941 All-Star Game uh, in the last of the ninth inning, and um, Ted Williams is at bat. You're in the on-deck circle. That's right. Joe beat out a ground ball and, broke, and stopped a double play and gave Ted an opportunity to come up against Claude Passo. And I think Passo had gotten Ted out on strikes the time before, so they had a big powwow out in the mound, and I wondered what they could be talking about. I didn't, I, they may want to walk him, and maybe give him nothing to hit, but it took quite a while, so I'm sitting in the on-deck circle. I said, I may have to go up there and bat. Well, I didn't have to. Ted hit the ball out of the ballpark, and we won the ball game. That was the last batter. So now we come to the end of the 41 season, and um, World War II starts, and you, uh, volunteered, tried to enlist in the Navy, and uh, they weren't interested in you at that at first. No, they turned me down because of my eyesight. I was not going to spend my time playing baseball while all my peers were serving time in the service. And so I told him, and he said, well, after a long period of time, said, well, I can do one thing. I could write a letter to the War Department and have members of the staff here at the federal building co-sign it, send it to them, and tell them that uh, they should accept you because your athletic ability will offset your eyesight. I don't know how that works, but that's what he said. And I said, he said, would you like 
for me to do that. I said, absolutely. Sixty days later, I was in the Navy. And served three years. At the, the age Navy, of 26, and, uh, 27, and 28. And lost those three years uh, right out of the prime of your career. Yeah. And um, probably cost you a chance to be in the Baseball Hall of Fame, but, oh, um, but you served your country. I did what I went set out to do. I've never regretted it. So you come back now, 1946, and the Red Sox have finally put it together. They have uh, Dorr at second base and Pesky at uh, shortstop, Williams in left field, DiMaggio in uh, center field, and everything worked out uh, perfectly except for the uh, seventh game of the World Series that they keep bothering Johnny Pesky about. Um, tell us what happened in that game in the top of the eighth inning. You're in St. Louis, trailing three to one, and you're up with two outs. So with men on second and third, and two out, I came to bat and worked the count to three and one, and then I put one foot out of the box and I got to thinking, and I was trying to figure out what Brokeen was going to throw me. I know he didn't really want to walk me, but uh, and he, he wouldn't throw his fastball because he wouldn't hurt you if he hit you between the eyes with it. And his curveball, he could not get over, so I expected him to throw me the screwball. And I figured he would try to throw the screwball on the outside part of the plate, thinking that I would try to pull the three-and-one pitch to left field. But I said, if he throws it out there, I'm going to hit it to the opposite field. And that's exactly what happened. He threw me a screwball, and it had the outside corner of the plate, and I hit it to right center field. I thought it was going to drop, but I, I heard, found out later that it, it hit the screen. It had it been another two feet toward center, it would have dropped into the stands, but the screen stopped it. When I got to first base, I felt to myself, if I could get to third on this hit, they're going to have to pitch very carefully to Ted. And if they throw, a, if, if Perkeen throws the smallest pass ball, I'm going to score. So in the process of digging for more speed, I pulled a muscle instead and barely got to second base and had to leave the game. And the leading run was my run on second base. And so uh, Ted didn't, didn't get the base hit. And in the bottom half of the ninth inning, Culberson was playing center field. And, we, and Harry had a hat walker who was a left-handed hitter but notorious left field hitter, uh, was batting with Slaughter on first base. And they had a hit and run on, and Slaughter took off. We tried to get Culberson over by Ted a good deal more than he was. And he did move over some, but not quite enough. And Walker's ball went, was going between Ted and uh, uh, Culberson. Culberson had to backtrack to stop the ball from going between them. And at the last second, Slaughter made a 90 degree turn and headed for home. He stated after the game that he remembered I had left center field. I had thrown three runners out previously, and they had stopped running. So he decided he'd go in. That statement was lost as time went on, which was justified, because he made the famous run, and that won the World Series for St. Louis. Welcome back. Although known as a great defensive center fielder, in the full seasons in which he played, statistics prove that Dominic DiMaggio was also one of the game's best hitters. In the years that you played, 40 through 42, then you lose three years in the service, then 46 through 52, we're not counting 53 when you only had three at bats, you had more base hits than anyone else in Major League Baseball. That's interesting. I, I didn't realize that. More base hits than Ted Williams, who's in the Hall of Fame. More base hits than Stan Musial, who's in the Hall of Fame. 
more bass hits than Joe DiMaggio, who's in the Hall of Fame. You had the second most runs scored of anyone in Major League Baseball in, the, in your period of playing. The only guy who beat you out on that was Ted Williams. Um, in 1941, of course, your, your brother Joe has the famous 56-game hitting streak, but you had a, pretty good, a couple of pretty good hitting streaks. And in fact, 60 years ago, you set the Red Sox consecutive game hitting streak that still stands today, all these years later. Yeah, I thought, uh, I thought Gachapara was going to go through it. He didn't quite make it. But you hit in 34 consecutive games. 34, correct. And I got stopped against the Yankees, and I hit two balls real hard that day. The last one was a famous line drive. I hit right by Rashi's ear. And as soon as I hit it, went by his ear. I said, well, that's 35. But the thing wouldn't drop. Kept, kept going and going and going. And Joe was standing right in front of it. If he hadn't caught it, it would have hit him right between the eyes. <laughs> so he had no choice but to catch it. And that was the last of my streak. 1948, you had a big year. You set the record uh, for putouts. You set the record for runs batted in for a leadoff hitter. And you married a beautiful woman. Thanks, Dick. You're right. There's a great picture, and I remember mentioning this to you once, uh, taken right in front of Lockober's Restaurant in, in Boston. And it's in the winter. You and Joe are just emerging from the, from the uh, restaurant in your overcoats. Uh, but you're in the background. You two fellows are in the background. And in the foreground are two uh, tremendous-looking women. One was Emily DiMaggio, and one was Marilyn Monroe. And uh, I remember mentioning that picture to you once and uh, saying, boy, those are two pretty good-looking dames. And you said to me, for my money, Emily had it all over Marilyn. <laughs> ah, you see, there you are. That's how I felt. So, and still do, and still, and still do. do. Emily tells the story of uh, the first time she went out with you. Um, she knew that she wanted to see you again, so she deliberately left a baseball in the glove compartment. Tell that story. A friend asked me to get a baseball for her, and I said I'd deliver it personally. We met one day, and then I didn't meet her again for four years. I met her uh, when we came up for an exhibition game with the Red Sox from Norfolk. And I didn't see her again for four years. She was still available. Welcome back. The building on Fisherman's Wharf, which once housed the famous DiMaggio's restaurant, is still owned by Dom, and in fact is now called the Dom DiMaggio Building. After retiring from the Red Sox, Dom became at least as big a success in the business world as he'd been on the baseball field. Oh, I wanted to put something on a piece of property for years, and finally I did it. Put my name right on it, called the Dom DiMaggio Building. And, uh, and right across from the restaurant, there's a boat docked there, which, which was your father's fishing boat. Yes, it was called the Libya after an Italian warship. Now it's called the Dixie. It was, it was re uh, uh, refurbished. Dominic DiMaggio should be in the Baseball Hall of Thanks, Fame. Thanks, Dick. And it's an injustice that he's too not. Too late now. I'm much too late. Have a younger fellow come in, somebody who can enjoy it. So it's a good, long, full life? Oh, I've had a great time. I have no complaints, Dick. And that is the story of Dominic DiMaggio, perhaps baseball's greatest, most underrated player. Every place but in the hearts of Red Sox fans. I'm Dick Flavin. Have a great week in Red Sox Nation.